if you don't think that Sasquatch can be just as cruel as us humans, this encounter might change your mind. I don't recommend listening to this if you have an affection towards dogs. That being said, grab a cup of coffee and enjoy this walk through Sasquatch territory. I'll never go back to that place. Not for a million years. Hell, I don't even think I'll go on another camping trip, hunting trip, fishing trip, a hike, or anything for the rest of my life. Keep me away from the trees is all I have to say. It's kind of funny, losing your life's passion in less than 24 hours. How is that even possible? If you're presented with enough fear to your mind, body, and soul, it's very possible. There are things out there that make people want to move immediately, whether it be from their house or off the planet entirely. If you're traumatized from getting your home robbed in the city, or are weary of the sounds of gunshots in the alleyways keeping you up at night, you may be thinking a life secluded in nature is the way to go. I hate to break it to you, but the human race isn't the only kind of monster out there. We've all heard that one before, right? The only monster out there is mankind itself. Sounds convincing. Had me fooled. Don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to tell people how to live their lives, but I'm just saying, if anyone is considering moving out into the wilderness to seek a life of peace, you might want to expect otherwise. There are things out there. I'm not talking lions, tigers, and bears. I mean there are beings out there that the public has limited information on. Things you wouldn't expect. I think it would be safer if we did expect those things, based on what I saw with my own two eyes, right in front of me here in Canada, in Manitoba. It was later in the winter, spring a few months away. I had some cabin fever and I needed to get out of the house that I had at the time perched out there in the countryside. It was considered a nice little home and still is by most. I just needed a change of scenery. It was 1986 and it was a long winter that year. So I made a trip out to go ice fishing for about a week or so. I took time off work and brought my ice shanty out onto the ice of a secret little lake I knew of surrounded by woods. The place was practically untouched, and I've always had some luck there. No one ever knew about it as far as my knowledge goes, cause every time I'd go there, there was never any sign of anyone. No footprints or garbage or anything at all. It really was one of those places you go and you feel like you're the last person left on the planet. And that feeling was exaggerated with that winter quiet. You know how the sound of bugs and frogs and birds are all gone and you hear absolutely nothing except the air itself? It was like that. My feet shuffled through the fresh snowfall and I made my way far onto the ice. The ice shanty wasn't one of those fancy ones with a kitchen and yada yada that you need a full blown pickup truck to haul. It was just one of those ones like a tent, fairly easy to carry around. If it were much colder I wouldn't have chosen to stay as long as I did. But with the temps being just around freezing, I could manage to stay pretty warm in there. And wind chill wasn't an issue either. The scream of my auger went as I drilled a good sized hole into the ice. When I finished the job, I switched it off. It echoed briefly and faded off as you'd expect. But what I did not expect is to hear something running off not long after that. I heard the sound of branches moving from the trees all the way across the lake on the other side. It startled me some and caught me off guard. It set me a little bit on edge because I could tell whatever might have been in those trees over there was pretty big. It made the trees in the general vicinity move around it. But I didn't really think much about it afterwards. I went on to do what I was doing. I was just out there enjoying myself. I got a couple bites and I ended up catching a good sized walleye. I was excited to see those shiny green scales and spiny fins. They're good eating especially caught in the wild like that. My mouth watered as I pictured it being cooked over a flame. I had one of those portable cookers with me propped up on a bucket, but I prefer to cook over the fire. It was beginning to get dark. Everything was starting to look that dim washed out blue like it does in the winter evenings on the days when the sun's gone. There was still enough daylight left for me to gather what I needed to make a fire. I had a little tinder box with me and some matches. I walked down the frozen lake onto the shore again. I looked for the driest spot to set up a fire and went from there. 
I took some dry and dead sticks and larger sized branches and stacked them on top of each other. Then I took some of that stuff from my tinderbox, like some cedar bark and bits of cattail covered in pine resin, and placed it beneath and a bit on top of the sticks. When I got that all set up, I went on to clean the walleye I caught. When that was finished, I managed to get the fire going. With the mixture of the cold air and the damp conditions, it was a pain in the ass and it took a few tries, but I got it. I put a good helping of butter on the miniature cast iron skillet and I let it heat up nice and hot. The next thing I did was I dropped in that walleye and the sound of it sizzling in the pan with the buttery aroma was a delight to the senses. Now all I had left to do was eat it. I took it off the flame and let it cool down. As I was waiting, I heard what sounded like a voice behind me. I first mistook it as my stomach rumbling, but I took a second guess when I heard it even louder. And in a deep voice, I heard exactly the word, fire, behind me. I looked around and nearly fell over. It was a man, but he looked like a caveman. First thing I thought was, wait a second, did I somehow time travel to the damn ice age? The guy was covered in long shaggy brown hair clumped in frost and snow. He wore no jacket or any sort of clothing item for that matter. Just a whole lot of hair. His large eyes reflected off the fire with the same kind of glare an animal's eyes would have. I couldn't think of anything else to say except, are you alright ma'am? Can I help you with something? He didn't respond. He just stood still in the trees staring as if he was trying to process something. Then I asked him if he was cold and needed to sit by the fire for a bit. He still didn't say anything, just stood there with his mouth partially open gazing at the fire. It kind of looked like maybe there was something wrong with him. I mean I don't know if this sounds offensive or not but he just sort of resembled that kind of look with the close and deep set eyes and just the way he seemed sort of confused. I felt sorry for him because he seemed kind of miserable out in the cold. So I stood up, walked over and handed him some of the walleye. At first he looked like he was going to run away as I slowly approached him because he leaned in the other direction while still maintaining eye contact. But he looked like he was a bit more hesitant to run because I saw him smell the air. Like he could smell the food and seemed to calm down. He looked at my hand that had the walleye in it reaching out to him and in response he slowly reached his long hairy arm out and held out his hand. When I put the walleye in his hand I realized that the guy was huge. Just seeing his hand compared to mine made me feel like I was a small child despite being a 30 year old man at the time. I paused for a moment cause I'll admit I was a bit scared right then. This guy could pick me up by the head with one hand if he wanted to. He took the fish but didn't eat it though, just held it awkwardly in his palm looking down at it with an expression like he didn't know what was going on. It didn't take long for him to do a bit of a clumsy jog off into the woods while holding the walleye close to his chest as he ran. I just shook my head, put out the fire and decided to call it a night. Even though I was real tired and trying to get some rest, my mind didn't want to. It kept going on about that strange person I interacted with a few hours earlier. I soon got a little skeptical, thinking that maybe where I was, my favorite fishing spot, was actually private property. Maybe it belonged to some weird cult-like community or something. I couldn't come up with any other reason why a person who looked like that found their way in the middle of nowhere to walk around with no clothing in the snow. But it still didn't explain why the man was built like a giant. When it got light out, I went back out into the woods to see if I could find a trail. I looked for his massive footprints in the snow and it didn't take me long to find them. They stuck out like a sore thumb. Typical human tracks with a heel and five toes but much larger. About three times as big as my feet and I was even wearing some bulky snow boots. If I took them off my feet would have been about a fourth of the size of his. It was hard to believe anyone would ever have feet that big but there the tracks were right in front of my face. I think the dark from the night before only being able to see what was going on from the light of the fire kept me from fully absorbing how big this guy really was and the more I thought about it the more I felt afraid. What if these prints would lead me into some sort of situation I didn't want to be in? But I really wanted to figure out what was going on. I continued to follow the steps. They eventually led to something that resembled a trail. Not so much of an official trail, more like something that would happen naturally by trampling over the same grounds over and over again. I noticed the footprints I was following split into a second set. 
and a third and a fourth. Basically, this place looked to be a common pathway for this guy, but that wasn't all. Some of the prints were different sizes than his, giving away that he wasn't the only one, and he wasn't the largest guy out there either. Some footprints were even bigger. If this wasn't all weird enough, I saw massive tracks of a canine walking next to some of the prints. I'm saying these were likely the tracks of a timber wolf or something, just walking next to the footprints like they were taking them on a walk. I was asking myself what the hell was going on and what kind of people are this big go barefoot in the middle of a Canadian winter and takes a damn wolf on a walk. This should have been my sign to head back, but I was way too curious. I went further down the trail till I made my way to a rugged looking clear out of trees. They were all snapped off and positioned out of the way leaning against the broken trunks. I wasn't sure what did all this. There wasn't any sign of the doing of a chainsaw and they were broken way too high up to have been done by a person with an axe. I would say the wind might have done it, but they looked like they were once strong and healthy trees. Each and every one of them was broken precisely in this exact place where I was standing, nowhere else. I went in further because I heard some ruckus going on in the general direction ahead of me. You'd think anyone with common sense would get the gist that this land is taken and they weren't supposed to be there so pack it up and get out of there by now. But I guess my thick skull couldn't comprehend or put the pieces together. I followed where the noise was coming from anyway. The more I went in, the louder it got, and I could make out the sound of an animal fighting another animal, like dogs fighting to be exact. The snarling, barking, and yelping was making a bold statement while breaking the usual calm silence of winter. On top of that, I heard hoots, like people hooting, but they were a little off. They sounded more like a group of chimps working up a commotion rather than people. Now I thought, is there a freaking zoo that's just around the corner that I didn't know about or what? I saw shadows out there, big ones. Then the light coming in through the trees got crowded out and everything got dark real fast. I thought I just managed to find my way into a pinier section of the forest, a place that had more evergreens than the rest of the forest. Nothing had that nice pine smell though. It smelled awful. It's indescribable. I got a little glimpse of the dogs fighting through some of the dead brush. But they weren't dogs, they were full-blown wolves. One looked like a timber and the other was an average wolf. And you can guess which one was winning. It was the timber wolf literally ripping the normal wolf to shreds. I kind of had to cringe seeing the strips of flesh hanging off the smaller one's body. That poor pup wasn't going to make it through that one, you could just tell. But he was still putting up a fight anyway. They were fighting in an arena type place, sort of resembled a small scale baseball field, just with organic elements because it was in the middle of the woods. I was doing my best to get a better look through the pile of branches I adopted as cover, and I got to see the full picture of what was really going on. The hooting I was talking about earlier, that was coming from an audience watching the wolves. An audience of the same kind of people as the big guy from the night before. There was a whole crowd of them there and they were all massive, but some were taller than others and some shorter. Some were fatter than others and some kind of skinny. Some had more hair and others had less, but they were all of the same kind. I couldn't count how many there were of them, and they were looking like they were cheering but in a kind of monkeyish way, with their long limbs tugging and throwing things in excitement. I realized this was a sick sport for these beings, dog fighting but with wolves instead of dogs. I scanned the crowd until I found the one that I met the night before at the fire. He was the runt of the bunch. He got pushed and shoved around like a teddy bear in a mosh pit. As interested as he seemed in the fight, you could see he was the insecure one. Just the way he acted compared to the others. Bashful. Judging by how animal-like these guys seemed, they probably had some sort of pecking order, and he was probably at the bottom of it. I had enough and I needed to move out of there. And to my luck, a blizzard came out of nowhere. Everything was getting all white real fast, and my life was on the line, whether it be being caught by that society freak show or freezing to death in those harsh conditions. I had to race the snowfall, because I didn't want the tracks that I made on the way there to be covered up completely. I ended up beating the race just barely. I got back to my ice fishing base and took cover for the rest of the day, until it slowed down later in the night. I didn't waste any time though. I packed everything up like I should have done in the first place and loaded it all up in the trunk of my car. I was thanking myself that I remembered to bring a snow shovel. I scooped my way out of there as fast as I could. It took around three hours to do all that and break through the ice. 
but I did. I got out of that situation, but my life was changed after that. I'm not the same person anymore. Everything was flipped upside down for me, and I had to find a new me. I'm not an outdoorsman anymore. I don't want nothing to do with it. I sold the house I had back then and moved to a suburban neighborhood in Winnipeg, something I never would have dreamed of doing beforehand. I don't know if these people, or if that's even the right word to use for them, are considered Sasquatch, but based on other encounters and descriptions, I think they very well may have been. From what I saw, they have a lot of cognitive abilities, like understanding the concept of a sport. We really don't understand the world as a whole, and I think it's foolish to think we can, but that doesn't mean knowledge isn't valuable. We're always evolving, and knowledge is key to evolution. My name's Jackson Garter, by the way. Thanks if you got around to this one. That encounter raises a lot of questions. I don't even know what to think about this one. Thanks for sending that in, man. And thank you, the viewer, for everything you do. We appreciate all your support.